several years ago, Ellen had the unique experience of working on a documentary called The Dust Bowl that was directed by the legendary Ken Burns. Uh, Ellen was already a film producer for PBS stations in Texas, and Ellen's mother, Pauline Durrett Robertson, was a child during the Dust Bowl, and she had written about that experience, so the producers reached out to Pauline as a living witness. The film's a chronicle of that massive environmental disaster of the 1930s and its impact on families and communities in an area that stretched all the way from the Dakotas in the north down to Texas in the south, and Colorado, all the way east of Missouri. Truth is, not many people remember the Dust Bowl because it was overshadowed by the Great Depression and then World War II. But up to that time, it was the largest environmental catastrophe ever caused by humans, at least a disaster that you could see unfolding in real time. Over the decades, in the early 20th century, Millions of acres of natural grassland, which had held the soil in place, were plowed up to grow wheat, corn, and other crops. In the rush for profits, they used techniques that fought nature instead of working with it. Periods of drought, year after year, and not enough water to irrigate, turned the land bone dry, and by the early 1930s, when the wind swept down from the Rockies across the Great Plains, clouds of dust formed that reached miles up into the air. Angry, boiling masses of suspended topsoil, fine and deadly particles, obliterated entire cities. Survivors described it in apocalyptic terms like something from out of the Old Testament. It created a nightmare landscape. People and animals, vehicles and roads, homes and barns and buildings were simply buried. Dust invaded every nook and cranny. You slept in it, you wore it, you ate it. The dust conducted static electricity. People were actually electrocuted when they reached out to touch the steel handle of their car door. Thousands of adults and children died from dust pneumonia. No one knows really how many. Vast numbers of people became homeless and just simply disappeared. Many people moved west to escape, starting a mass migration to California, and many people who remained went insane and committed suicide in huge numbers. Dirt and dust carried 1,500 miles, landed on the East Coast, even coating the White House desk of Franklin Roosevelt. No one had ever seen or had ever lived through anything like it. But despite all that, many people stayed and they survived. And those folks who were children at the time, like Pauline, became the stars of this documentary. And when Ken Burns' crew interviewed Pauline and the other witnesses to the Dust Bowl, they were well into their 80s or 90s. And they wept openly as they told of their fear and hardships of burying siblings and parents and the sheer terror of an ominous black wall of dust appearing in the sky and then swallowing them up before they could even run for cover. One of the main points of the Dust Bowl documentary is that, as bad as it was, the very same land management mistakes that resulted in that disaster are being made all over again in many parts of that same area. Combined with the effects of climate change, another Dust Bowl could easily happen, and this time, our ability to produce enough food to feed our own population would be in serious jeopardy. That sounds bleak. And there are smart farmers and scientists working to avert that, but the larger legacy of the Dust Bowl is about human resilience. The Dust Bowl lasted nine years, so it's about taking a journey through an extraordinarily difficult and long moment and coming out on the other side. Now, the best book I've ever read that chronicles the Dust Bowl is called The Worst Hard Time by Timothy Egan. It's a great book and a great title because it affirms that hard times are part of the human experience. Every generation slogs through a hard time or a sequence of hard times, and yet somehow we persevere. My own mother, whose name was Pauline, just like Ellen's mom, grew up in one of nine children in the piney woods of East Texas on the opposite side of that state. 
very rustic area, to put it mildly. <laughs> when I asked her what it was like to live through the Great Depression, she said everyone she knew just sort of laughed at newspaper headlines about the hard times people were going through all over the country. Mass unemployment, banks closing, people hungry and homeless. She said they laughed because where she lived, that had been their reality as long as anyone could remember. Many people never had electricity or indoor plumbing or access to health care. Having enough food to go around was never guaranteed. So for them, the depression was business as usual. It didn't make things any worse, but it certainly didn't help. I, I asked her, how did you make it through all of that? And she said, we had our family, we had our community, and we had our hope in God. We relied on each other. When I stop to consider all that we're going through today, I reflect on life in the generation of our parents, of all the brave Paulines out there. I know they wouldn't call themselves brave, but the hard times they lived through were genuinely hard. They were scary and uncertain. So if I'm ever frustrated because my Wi-Fi goes out for a few minutes and I can't watch something on Netflix or a package doesn't show up on my porch when it's been promised to arrive, or I don't get an email back from someone as soon as I think I deserve a response, it's a good reality check to admit that the privileges and advantages and ease I take for granted would have been undreamt of extraordinary luxuries a few short decades ago. I'm also reminded that the events we see as unprecedented, just because they're happening in our particular lifetime, the idea that no one else has ever been through the stress of what we're going through, well, it's rather presumptuous. Hard times, even if we might call it the worst hard time in our experience, are actually more common than not. I don't know if that helps much. We do have to navigate our own time, and it is challenging. Our experience is our experience, and comparing it to the experience of previous generations, that only goes so far. It doesn't mean that what we're going through is easy or stress-free. This pandemic stinks to high heaven. It is brutal. 3,000 people are dying every single day. That scale of grief is staggering. The dread we feel because someone we love has a health condition that would make them especially vulnerable. The nagging sense that a simple trip to the grocery store is like playing Russian roulette. And the cumulative effect of months of not being able to spend time in the company of people you care about is so disheartening. We're social creatures. I don't care how many Zoom meetings I attend. They might be convenient and efficient and all that, but they just don't cut the mustard of providing the kind of human connection that we all crave. And the fact that we have stuff going on, like fellow citizens calling themselves patriots, running around with automatic weapons who genuinely believe in an alternate version of reality is genuinely frightening. It's all exhausting. It's a hard time. It may be our worst hard time. So what would the brave Paulines in our lives have done if this was their time? As my mom said, we relied on our family, our community, and our hope in God. We relied on each other. The way I understand that is that when you're faced with something that's hard, when life itself is hard, reliance is not something we can pull out of our own bag of tricks. It's something that is shared. Now, in our culture, we praise self-reliance and self-sufficiency. We idolize and make celebrities of people who are self-made and who, who appear to go alone. You know, John Wayne, you know, well, he built an entire persona around that myth. But we need to understand it is a myth. Anyone who claims they pull themselves up by their own bootstraps is forgetting conveniently that they have bootstraps to begin with. So many of our social policies buy into that mythology that any individual can succeed on their own if they just apply themselves and work hard enough. Sounds great. If you're someone who's already been blessed with advantages you might not even be aware of because of where you live or the kind of family you came from or the color of your skin. Now, that doesn't mean that you haven't worked hard or you haven't sacrificed. It's just that if life was a foot race, you might not be aware that your starting line is already several yards ahead of all the people behind you. 
Dig a little deeper, and almost always, those who defy the odds of their disadvantages have had a whole host of people helping them along. We all rely on others. We all live in relationship. And it's absolutely true that when we stumble, when we struggle, when the hard time inevitably comes, that's when our reliance on each other matters most. Nisha read one of my very favorite passages in the entire Bible, Prophet Isaiah giving a word of hope to his people who are living through their own worst hard time. Isaiah said, Don't you know... Those who rely on God will renew their strength. Those who can barely walk, they feel so faint of heart, they will scamper around again like little kids. You'll run and not be weary. You're going to soar like an eagle. In a nutshell, Isaiah was saying, don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Now, hearing that today can sound a little optimistic, but I think it's what we need, and it's what we need to share. The other day, I was picking up our dog, Pearl the Wonder Westy, from an appointment at the veterinarian. Our vet clinic has a certain COVID safety protocol. So you park out front, you wait in your car, and you call them. If you're dropping off a pet, they'll come out and get it. If you're picking up a pet, they'll bring your pet out to you. And as I sat there in my car, I wasn't thinking that protocol was particularly hard in itself. It was just weird. I was thinking, you know, I don't want this to be normal. I want to return to a world where I can go inside, look at the people there with no one needing to wear a face mask, ask them how things are going, talk about nothing in particular like what their favorite dog breed is, to discuss the pros and cons of dog biscuits, to see who they think is going to win the Super Bowl. Do they even care about the Super Bowl? But just to have all of those subtle human interactions that people have, those things matter, and I miss them. All the things I once took for granted. The lack of that might seem small, but it's the cumulative sense of loss that's hard. So when the vet technician came out to deliver Pearl to me, I wondered if Pearl had any awareness of how all this was affecting all the people in her world. Maybe Pearl has no idea. I hope not. But I was genuinely overjoyed just to say hello to that young woman, that vet technician I'd never met before. Not because she brought my dog to me, but because here was another human being who was going through the same weirdness that we're all experiencing. She was nice, and maybe it was just me, but I sensed some fatigue on her part. So I said, how are you doing? She paused and stared at me for what seemed like a long moment. Okay, I think. So I said, hang in there, it's going to get better. And even though I was addressing her specifically, I had the sense that I was also offering a kind of prayer for her and for me and anyone and everyone in this hard time. I know it might sound goofy to think that, but just in case she might have needed to know a moment of community, maybe just a few seconds of something to rely on, to hope for, to hear another person affirm, there it was, I hoped. It was what I had to give to say, don't give up, keep on keeping on. No one knows when this hard time will end. No one knows when our lives will feel normal again. No one knows what normal will even look like. As much as we'd like to, you know, it's not our job to know. But that's not the same as giving up, just the opposite. We're not giving up when we rely on family, on our community, on our hope in God, and on each other. Because with God and with each other, even in the tiny and seemingly insignificant encounters, we can always say, don't you know, you do have something to rely on. The day will come when weariness will return to strength and soaring like an eagle is possible again. Rely on that because right now I'll rely on you and you can rely on me. We can all rely on God and we will persevere through this hard time together.